following message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. Well, if you'll take your Bibles today, I'd like to have you turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 20. Acts chapter number 20, and uh, the passage I'd like to read begins in verse number 17 down to verse number 27. Acts chapter 20, verse number 17 where the Bible says, And from Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now my purpose in this message is to present to you, the church, the vision and the theme for the year 2020. And what better theme could there be than that that is found in Acts 2020, where the Bible says, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Acts 2020, to me, is a text that exudes intensity. There is an intensity in Paul's communication. He says, I kept back nothing. There is an intensity in his methods. He said, I have showed you and have taught you. And there's certainly an intensity in the scope of his ministry, as he says, publicly and from house to house. Now, these words that we've read this morning were spoken by Paul at the conclusion of his third evangelistic journey, where we find him travelling with about eight other men on their way to Jerusalem. And during a layover in the port city of Miletus, Paul used that opportunity to call for the Ephesian pastors. Ephesus was not that far away, and he called for these men to come and meet with him a final time. These were men that he had trained over the past three or so years. They were men who he had possibly personally won to Jesus Christ himself. Certainly they were men with whom he had spent much time. And so Paul is using this meeting with these preachers to give them a farewell charge. These were the last words he wanted to leave with them ringing in their ears. And as we read this passage, we see that he does so by recounting to them the way that he ministered to them when he first came to Ephesus and during that time that he spent in the great city. And what he's saying is that I have done this with you and now I'm charging you to carry on in the same fashion. It's really a very personal portion of scripture. Paul, from time to time, in the writings of the word of God, bears how he felt about things. It bears his heart in the matter. And here is one place where Paul is 
reminding them of what they had already experienced, but of what he did when he served Christ among them. In fact, it's so personal that he uses the word I 17 times in the passage, the latter half of this chapter. And eight times he uses the word me, my, and myself. But Paul is sharing that with the men. It's, he's not speaking theoretically here. He's telling them, this is what I did, and this is how I served the Lord among you. And by reviewing his ministry over this time, he then transfers it to those that he's leaving behind. We see that there in verse 28, where we find, having explained his ministry, he says, take heed therefore unto yourselves. That word therefore is the connecting word that means really in effect, I kept back nothing from you. I gave you everything. I gave you my life to see this church established and now you as the preachers, you as the bishops, the overseers, the elders of the church, you go out now and feed the flock and you give them all you've got. And that's the thought that I want to convey to each of us today through our theme for the coming year, 2020, and that theme is expressed simply as serving with an Acts 2020 vision. I think it's kind of fitting because if you'll recall the last two years, including this one that is still with us, uh, we've had our themes and our directions taken from the book of Acts. In 2018, our theme was assuredly gathering. That's when we had come through a year of prayer and seeking God's will and we were now as a church assuredly gathering that the Lord wanted us to proceed into the South Pacific and that was based on Acts 16.10. And then this year as we continue on, the theme has been expressed in Acts 16.11 with a straight course. We'd set our hand to do something we believed with all our hearts that this was what God wanted us to do, so with a straight course we have pressed on. And now this coming year we press on with an Acts 20, 20 vision. You know, we have two major evangelistic outreaches going on. We've had the South Pacific Baptist outreach for the past two years that has occupied a lot of our time and our thinking and our praying and and so forth but also over in eastern Washington we have a great effort underway there and these are both major efforts from our church they are church ministries and they require much manpower and money among other things and I think most of us are probably quite aware of that but having said that I would also point out to me at least it's obvious and hopefully to you as well that now is not the time for our church to start another new evangelistic outreach. I I try to follow the principle of uh, the parable of our Lord in Luke chapter 14 uh, where he talks about building and going to war and he says for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it. And what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? I mean, there is a principle of wisdom that is applied here. And certainly as we think about the unfinished tasks that we have going on and so much more that needs to be accomplished in these two fields of endeavor, I don't think that we're going to be announcing today that God is now opening up another door for us to go through. We don't necessarily have the manpower ready and, and, and so forth, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But also because so much more needs to be accomplished in these two fields of endeavor. The mission in the city of Wenatchee in eastern Washington, the Blessed Hope Baptist Outreach, needs to grow to the point of being able to be organized into an independent Baptist church that can stand in its own right and on its own two spiritual legs, so to speak. And uh, the, the beachhead that has been 
uh, very uh, blessed of God in the South Pacific still needs to be consolidated and expanded. We understand that and as I mentioned I think before uh, this past week that I felt like the vision for 2020 is going to come to us as a church through the vision of our evangelists. And so at our leadership retreat this past week, we were briefed firstly by Brother Chris Majors as to his vision for the Blessed Hope Baptist Outreach. And that vision, simply put, is to win souls in the city of Wenatchee and around about and to grow both numerically and spiritually uh, to the end that they will have a, a, a solid group of faithful believers who are ready to stand and be counted and to be organized as a church. That's the goal there. And certainly the, the uh, new partnership with uh, uh, Brother Josh Hauer and his wife Chantel is, has the potential to uh, see that begin to take place. And we uh, pray for them and, and we're looking forward. But that's the vision there. It's, it's pretty straightforward. There needs to be uh, that kind of uh, work done and that, that's the, the work of the Lord there in the city of Wenatchee. But also by Brother Jeremiah Sargent, his vision for the South Pacific Baptist outreach in the coming year was shared with the men at the leadership retreat and we were blessed by his report to the church last Sunday morning and at the retreat and uh, tonight, I would strongly encourage you to be back because we're going to hear more of his vision and plans for 2020. And they are very, very exciting. So while our vision for 2020 will come mainly through our evangelists and what they want to do and our part in that, that doesn't mean that the ministries that are going on here in Oak Harbor are to be visionless. And that's not the case at all. We are invested in our mission outreaches, but what I have read here in Acts chapter 20, I believe applies to all of us who are engaged in ministry, even those of us here in Oak Harbor. And my thought is that why should we here in this church body, why should we expect a 2020, an Acts 2020 intensity of those that we send out and not serve the Lord here with the same intensity. I don't think that makes sense. It's been put this way, and I like this statement, the light that shines the farthest shines brightest at home. And so, you know, that's what I'm trying to convey here in this message this morning that as Paul challenged these Ephesian preachers to, to continue on and to, to exhibit the same kind of intensity in ministry, he wants, we want the same for you and, us, uh, you and me today here uh, in our own church. Now, you might be thinking in your mind, well, hang on a moment, how could we ever match the intensity of the Apostle Paul? After all, he was one of those super Christians, right? He was one that none of us would ever hope to attain to the same stature. He was head and shoulders above any man. But is that, the, is that really true? Because it seems, as I pointed out there in verse 28, that Paul expected the same level of commitment from these elders, now, they would not necessarily have the same ministry that Paul had, but whatever ministry God had given them, he was saying you need to, to exhibit the same characteristics and intensity of ministry that I have uh, shown you during my time there. And so my question is, why not the same of you and me, we who serve in various ministries? One of the Hallmarks of Bible Baptist Church is the great number of people who are involved in some ministry. Certainly we should not uh, think that a, a common thing. There are many churches where a lot is done by a few, but we have many people involved, not just as pastors and deacons and, and so forth, but there are those who teach, there are those who look after children, there are those who 
prepare food. There are those who clean. There are those who do all kinds of things, singing in the choir, musicians. We could go down a long list of ministries. And what I want those of you who are involved in ministries today is to consider Paul's testimony and the example that's given in his charge and say, do I have the same intensity in what I do for the Lord? So I have three questions I'd like to put before you based on what we've read here in the book of Acts chapter 20. These questions are, what is your motivation? Number two, what is your mindset? And then number three, what is your ministry? Now, if you're sitting there and saying, well, I don't really have a ministry, but I'd like one, just keep on listening because we're going to give you an opportunity here in a few moments' time. But my first question is, what is your motivation? What is your motivation for serving? Look at verse number 18 again, if you would. When Paul gathered these preachers around him, when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Now we know the Lord's work is a priority. I hope it is with you. Now, I understand that there is to be a balance and a pers- in, in uh, uh, that perspective. We, we uh, make it very clear that your personal relationship with the Lord must always come first. Secondly, if you're married, your relationship with your spouse. Thirdly, if you have a family, that your relationship with your family takes that third position. The order is very important. And then after that comes the ministries of the church. But let's not use that as an excuse to say, well, I'm not going to serve the Lord in anything in the church because I have my wife, my family, and my walk with with the Lord. That just takes all my time. The fact is they are ministries too, and we can add to that ministry. But I want to challenge you about how you pursue your ministry. And the way we can do that is looking at what Paul said, particularly in relation to time. There are four statements of time in this text. In verse, nine, uh, verse number 18, he says, from the first day, from the first day. Well, what does that say? It shows a, a sense of urgency. He didn't say, well, I'd like to serve God in Ephesus, but you know what? I'll, I'll get around to it in a couple of years' time. It's just not in my schedule anymore. You know, our schedules can sometimes prevent us from doing something for the Lord. He said from the very first day, and if you want to read what that first day was like, you turn back to Acts chapter 18 and look at verse number 19 where the ship that Paul and Priscilla and Aquila was on stopped off at Ephesus, no doubt to offload or take on cargo and perhaps some other passengers, and there was a a short time spell there where the ship would be in dock. And the Bible says, and he, Paul, came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So we have here an account of how that ship pulled in and the first thing Paul did on the first day was to go and try to find someone to win to Christ. And he had every reason to, uh, humanly speaking, to have been able to say, you know what, I just need to rest I just need to take it easy. If you read what went on before, during that second evangelistic outreach that he made, he and Silas were soundly beaten in Philippi. He said shamefully entreated. He was thrust into prison. He was uh, was chased out of Thessalonica. He was brought before uh, the governor uh, in Corinth. He was persecuted all along the way by Jews. He was beaten. He was a a man who was worn out in the ministry. And so we could say, Paul, just sit on the deck. Enjoy the sunshine. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of the journey. But instead, Paul's intensity was, here's an opportunity. I'm going to take it. The second time phrase here and also in verse Number 18 is all seasons, all seasons. He said, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, you know from the first day that I came into Asia 
after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. So we see here a consistency in his ministry. It reminds us of what he wrote to Timothy later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, where he said, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, Timothy, there will be times in your ministry when it's not easy to serve God, when it would be much easier to sit back and just rest for a while. But he said, I want you to preach the word regardless of the seasons. I have to smile at that because we know that seasons do have an impact in the word of God. I think over in, uh, in Wenatchee, this is getting to be the cold season. There'll be snow on the ground. It gets below freezing. It's a little more difficult to get out and knock doors and, and, and engage people, but the work of the Lord can continue. Uh, in, in the South Pacific, it's the reverse. Now is the stinking hot season when it's very difficult for people who are not acclimatized to, to function in that, in that environment, but it doesn't mean that you just say, well, we shut down for the summer or we shut down for the winter. And Paul is uh, teaching us here that maybe our service and the way we do things will change a little bit according to the seasons of life and the seasons of nature, but we keep on serving. Then the third thing he said in verse 31, as he spoke to these preachers, he said, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day. You're saying, come on, are you expecting that of me, preacher? Well, I'll tell you what, night and day tells me that there was no late Saturday night preparation done by Paul. He didn't say, oh, I've got a Sunday school class or a children's group or children's church to get ready for on Sunday and, well, here it is Sunday morning, I'll squeeze it in somehow or I've got a, a ladies group or whatever it is. I mean, Paul was just, he was very careful and night and day he was laboring and he said with tears. And uh, that doesn't mean he was crying over the message. He said, this is a terrible message. I mean, it just shows his heart. It shows that his heart was for these people. He desired to give them the very best of God's word. And that heart of Paul brought him a connection to the people that he had. Those of you who have a ministry involving others, do you have a connection with them? Or is it just a routine of service where you just come and do what you're supposed to do and then forget all about it? I mean, Paul poured his life into these people and his tears show that, but I'll tell you the reward was, if you look at the end of the chapter, when he's about to leave in verse 36, and when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all, and they all wept sore. They all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. And the reason that they did that is because Paul had wept over them. His heart was in the ministry. This was his motivation. And then also in verse 24, he speaks about finishing his course. He says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. He had no plans for retirement. He had no plans to say, well, I'll... I'll, I'll do this ministry for a year and then I'll turn it over to somebody else. As far as he was concerned, he's going to finish the course. And of course, he mentions that again in 2 Timothy later on when he is about to finish that course of life. In verse number six, he said, For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That was his motivation in serving God. And I would recommend that if you're going to serve God and he said with joy and you have joy in doing that, our motivation needs to be along the same lines. Paul's motivation was a love that was constrained by Jesus Christ. That motivated him to give his life so that that church could be established in the great city of Ephesus. And so I would simply ask for those of us who are serving God in some fashion, 
What is your motivation? How would you describe your motivation today? The second question I want to bring forth is simply another, that is, what is your mindset? What is your mindset? How do you see the the service under the Lord? Look at verse 19 here in Acts chapter 20. Paul, going on, says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Now, Paul here is talking about the way he thinks or thought about his ministry. He says, humility of mind. The mind is where we think. And first of all, he viewed his ministry as that of serving the Lord. He says, verse 19, serving the Lord. It was a ministry that he recognized he had received of the Lord. Verse 24, he talks about that. Now, understand that ministry usually involves serving others. And that's true, but if we are to prevent ourselves from becoming cynical in that ministry or becoming burned out in our ministry, we must see it as primarily unto the Lord. When you're ministering to people, it's true, sometimes people can be difficult. Sometimes people can hurt you. Sometimes people can misunderstand you. And if we allow people to be the focus instead of the Lord, we're likely to just develop an attitude that's not healthy. And yes, we may continue doing that ministry, but not with the right mindset. We're told, in, taught in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, that whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. For ye serve the Lord Christ. So he speaks about serving the Lord. Then he speaks about humility of mind because Paul recognized that with the ministry that God had given to him, there was always a danger of him becoming puffed up with his own self-importance. After all, he was the apostle to the Gentiles and he held a high position in the work of God. But he also wrote in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3 and admonishes us, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We are just sinners saved by grace, and by the grace of God we are privileged to serve the Lord. And Paul said, I have humility of mind. I know who I am. He, he wrote about that. He, he said that I was the chief of sinners, but God had mercy on me. And it's not because of me that I'm serving. And, and, and so here is how he was thinking about his ministry. I think we would describe his mindset as a man who was sold out to Jesus Christ, who was more concerned with making his life count for Christ than counting his own life. In fact, he said that there, you'll notice in verse 24, he said, neither count I my life dear unto myself. That was his mindset. That is the mindset of John the Baptist, as is recorded in John chapter 3 and verse number 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. What is your mindset in the ministries you have? And then lastly, the question is, what is your ministry? What is your ministry? Well, Paul describes his ministry in Acts 20, 20 and verse 21 and also verse 27. He said, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse number 27, he said, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Would you say that he, he uh, gave it everything? I think that's a good way of putting it. But what he is describing here in these words is the way he went about his church planning ministry. And Bible Baptist Church of Oak Harbor is engaged in two church planting ventures. And while everyone will not be involved hands-on in those ministries per se, yet we must understand that we're all working together to a common end. And a lot of that's by what we do here. 
that the home base is kept strong and vibrant and scriptural and our prayers remain fervent unto the Lord on behalf of those that have been sent out. And so we see how Paul looked at his ministry and, and how it was and <clears throat> there's a number of characteristics that I want to point out very quickly. Number one, it was beneficial. He said, I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. You know, when we serve God, we need to say, what is, how am I benefiting others? How am I helping others? And you might say, well, preacher, I work with small children, real small children. But those small children are going to be learning uh, the, 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 the way we do things. And as they grow on, they'll learn what the word of God says. I mean, teaching begins right at the earliest of ages. And uh, every ministry of the church we ought to be saying, I want to profit. I want to see those that I have an influence in in their life become better for the Lord, to serve God, to know more, to grow more. Paul had that desire when it came to ministry. It was multifaceted. He, he modelled the ministry by hands-on. He said, I have showed you. you know, that's the way parents are supposed to bring up their children, barking out orders. <laughs> well, maybe you'll get a few things done, but most children at first need to be shown. Needs a dad or a mom to come alongside their son or daughter and say, now let me show you what I'm saying and hands-on teaching them. And that's how we teach baby Christians. We don't just give them a list of do's and don'ts, but we show them and model how it's to be done. And so there is more to ministry than just talking. And Paul said, I've showed you. And yes, he, he gave instruction. He said, I've taught you. People need to know the word of God and there's a great place for that. He said that he was very adaptable. He uh, didn't come to Ephesus and uh, find a building and put a pulpit there and put some pews out and say, now when people come, I'll preach to them. <laughs> the Bible says he did it from house to house and publicly Publicly means out in the marketplaces, it means in the shopping centres, it means in the streets, wherever he found people. And from house to house, it was Paul who put himself out to reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was very adaptable. And he used all means, legitimate and scriptural, to reach these people with the gospel. Not only was it multifaceted, but it was multicultural. And we see more of that as the days go on. He said to the Jews and also to the Greeks. We know over in eastern Washington, there are different cultures represented there. A strong Hispanic culture as well as others who come in as migrant workers from different places in the world. Certainly in the South Pacific, multiculturalism is a feature of of many of those countries. We see it there and we see it even in our own local uh, society. But then I see also it was a focused ministry in verse 21. He said, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't pull any punches when it came to how people get saved because the world is full of people who think that salvation comes by other means, whether by being a good person, whether by being sprinkled with water and called it baptism, or whether being baptized by immersion, thinking, well, this is how I get right with God. And there are people, so many people in our own society and in the mission fields who don't know the way of salvation, and the way to Christ is through repentance and faith. Repentance means to turn from our old life 180 degrees and in faith receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. And Paul was consistent in that. He was focused, pointing the lost to Christ. He gave them the gospel. That's what Bible Baptist Church ultimately is all about. Fulfilling the Great Commission both here and around the world to preach the gospel to every creature. Never let us lose sight of that fact. And then pointing believers to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul had a ministry. It was a great ministry. 
Maybe we'll never get to do all the things that Paul did, but we should have a ministry. And I would ask you to think about the ministry that you have. Are you flexible in that ministry? Or do you just have set times, this is when I'm going to do it, and if people don't come, too bad. Are you selfless? Do you give yourself to that ministry? Are you outgoing? These are the things I'd like us to think about. You see, this passage that Paul spoke to these men from Ephesus is what I call a great mirror passage. It's a great mirror passage because when we look into this as if it was a mirror, and the Bible is described as a mirror, it's very convicting when you look at yourself. You look at the way that you conduct your ministry, your motivation. How motivated am I really to serving God? What is my mindset? What do I think about ministry? Is it become a bother? Is it something that I, I wish I could shake off, but you know people will talk about me, so I better not? Or is, do I have a mindset that's scriptural? And do I have a ministry? You know, as I read this passage, and as you will read it, it reminds me of the cost, the human cost of church planting. Ultimately, we are engaged in getting a church established in eastern Washington. And ultimately in the South Pacific, not just in Fiji, but around the nations of the South Pacific. And the human cost to do that, not, not the financial cost, but the human cost, it takes hard work. It takes tears. It's long work. It's, it's not just a nine to five job, clock in, clock out. Paul was night and day. Whenever people needed him, whenever the door opened, the opportunity arose, he was there. And he had limited strength. He wasn't a superman. But because of what he did in those three years, there was great fruit. His efforts paid off. Now we know it was all of God, but certainly God used him and a great church was established. One of the great churches in the New Testament established in the city of Ephesus. What did it require to get that church going? Simply put, it required an Acts 2020 intensity. And anything done for Christ demands the same. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Do it with thy might. That was Paul. He didn't do it half-heartedly. He didn't do it part-time. He did it with all his might. And the Bible goes on to say, For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Beloved, we all have just a short time here on this earth. Our life is like a vapor. It may go for 80 or 90 years, but it's still just like a vapor. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I think Paul knew that. And in that time, he did it with all his might. So this morning, I'm asking, will you commit to serving our Lord and Savior with an Acts 2020 vision? If you're already serving in ministries, I certainly appreciate that and thank you. But I'm asking, will you dedicate yourself to this end for the coming year? That I'm going to serve with a 20, Acts 2020 vision. And if you have no ministry at this time, will you seek one for the coming year? The preceding message was preached from the pulpit of Bible Baptist Church, Oak Harbor, Washington. You can find additional information about the church and our publications ministry on the web at bbcoakharbor.org. For further assistance with specific questions, please feel free to give us a call at area code 360-675-8311. Thank you for listening. Our prayer is that you received a blessing from the preaching of God's word.